Okay, so uh, today is going to be just a little different in that I'm going to force you to talk to me, <laughs> whether you want to or not. And what I mean by that is that I'm going to just spend our time asking questions and trying to elicit information and discussion about some things. And I do have something I want to share with you, but I, I want to start here first. So I mentioned um, our Christmas celebrations. Now, we are now well into the new year. I think that's fair to say. And in some households, uh, Christmas really doesn't start until the third week of December, and it's over by the new year, if you know what I mean. In other families, it's all you can do to keep some members from decorating the day after Thanksgiving, if not the evening of Thanksgiving after dinner, and some things still being unremoved even now. <laughs> Just saying. Right. So let me start with this. Who, who grew up with the real tree tradition? All right. So who still maintains the real tree tradition? And artificial. Both. Uh -huh. Oh, you got it covered. A couple of okay. Real artificial. Real artificial. <laughs> <coughs> now, all of this is what, where I'm going is not about Christmas, but but we're going to use this as an example. So. I had a similar experience. I grew up with the real tree tradition. And then there came a point very early in my marriage where traditions clashed. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, in my wife's home, a uh, non real tree was the norm. In Great Britain, I mean, can you imagine? What are they going to do with all those trees? Where are they going to put them when it's over? How are they going to get rid of them? I mean, plastic trees, as we called them then, artificial trees, were a commonplace and often not even green. Silver or that whitey look about them. And so those two traditions clashed very early in our home. And Beth, um, so Beth made me a proposition as spouses sometimes do. We can either get an artificial tree or you can do the cleaning up. <laughs> well, I saw very quickly that these traditions are just that. They're just man-made traditions, right? So we, we transitioned fairly quickly to an artificial tree once we had kids, and we had kids within a year of, you know, Andy came in 13 months. And, you know, when the, you got needles everywhere and the, the children, it just, it became a thing very quickly. And we were living in my mother's home, not in our home. So our little patch was, had to be, um, you know, Beth was very conscientious about keeping everything just so. So anyway, that tradition uh, was not upheld. However, there was an alternative dynamic. And that is, I grew up with, do you remember tinsel? Okay, that went away too. <laughs> but tinsel was a big deal. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times we had Christmas and tinsel was both on the tree and everywhere else eventually in the house <laughs> somehow. That, yes, and you had the Hoover, as Beth would call it, the Hoover, and it would tear that up. So I persuaded her to consider um, going with a little more modest Christmas presentation of decorations, which meant that, you know, my mom had, had moved towards using the white lights. And we, when I was a kid, we had different colored lights, but my mom went for a more elegant look with the, you know, the lights in the window and the white lights on the tree and so forth. But see, when, when Beth 
and I moved back to the States and started celebrating Christmas here every year, um, we had something here in the United States, here in Northern Virginia, not far from here, that they don't have in Great Britain. And that's Kmart. And so not only did we get rid of the traditional Christmas tree, suddenly, because my mom, Beth and I bought the house from my mother, my mother moved to North Carolina, and suddenly we had, well, Beth had full reign over, over the house. And, well, Kmart just offered some options she had never had an opportunity to explore when she was growing up, which means we had thousands of blinking lights that came out of nowhere, just showed up one day. And then it continued to grow, and we had Santa Claus who could move. And we, we had what I called in those days a Kmart Christmas every year because the lights were cheap, you know, the decorations were cheap. So we just had loads and loads of stuff. Now, mercifully, mercifully, that has diminished some, largely because we have a much, here, much smaller home here. Hello? Um, we had something here in the United States, here in Northern Virginia, not far from here, that they don't have. That's me <laughs> in Great Britain. What is going on? <laughs> and that's Kmart. Hey, Tree, yes. I'm talking to myself. And so not only What's did going we get on? rid of the traditional Christmas tree, what is going Suddenly. on? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, so my point is, and, and again, I want to hear from you, what's the most dramatic transition that you've encountered in your life relative to your Christmas celebrations? For us, it's we've moved to a smaller house and we went from seven Christmas trees to four. So... And no more blinking lights. Well, not everywhere at least. Every room has to have Christmas. So every room now has Christmas. An expression of Christmas. Yes, John. Best friends of everything. Right. Here. Yeah. Uh, my father and his family goes back centuries as Lutherans. And Lutherans... Uh, do Advent in a big way. Mm -hmm. and that and Christmas don't mix. Right. And so after fourth Advent, right. you could put the tree in. No tree till even. No tree till, because uh, fourth Advent. it's Advent. It's Advent candles. It's, right. it's Advent calendars. In church, it's Advent hymns. You know, but, right. And uh, after fourth Advent, you could put the tree up. Mm-hmm. But Christmas lasts 12 days. Of course. And so uh, from the count from the 25th to the 6th. Of January. And Epiphany. And the night before Epiphany, the, it comes down. So for the most part, you, the tree was up 12 days. You had 12 days. And, and that was it. Right, right. Well, I want to come right back to that. But other changes in tradition. It was warm where you grew up. We did not have enough <laughs> Tell everybody where you were living. Oh, and take the microphone, please. <clears throat> Got it? Palm trees don't lend themselves to Christmas lights very well. Not so well. It's hard to scale up to the top and get all the branches decorated. Were you in Barbados at the time? Guadalupe. Guadalupe, okay. They went to Barbados after I left home for that's college. That's right, that's right. I so, knew that. You know, I, I left home for college and they, they went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Can't go home again. <laughs> um, our Christmas decorations, I mean, we, we had the tree up and it was a, it was a fig tree. Uh, when Ann and I got together, um, we were in a small town house and then later on into a big house. And So it hasn't been a dramatic change, more so it's just a ever-increasing Mm -hmm. amount of decorations 
and we're in the same camp. Every room has something Christmassy in it, top to bottom, all three floors. <laughs> we have a village with a couple of dozen houses in, in it, mm -hmm. like that. Um, I currently have the whole house wired up with Alexa, so everything comes on automatically. That's right. much better than running around plugging and unplugging 50 things. That's clever. It just turns on at sundown, and or you can, if it's a dark overcast day, you just say, turn on decorations, and the right. house lights up. Well, we just have a small plastic Christmas tree now, but to compensate, we went up to uh, Longwood Gardens where they had 500,000 lights. 500,000? 500, and that's another tradition, you know, families piling in cars and going places and riding through like Bull Run, you know, used to have quite the light show, and they still do. <clears throat> so we... So there's two things to point out here. On the one hand, people have not surrendered their Christmas observances. But there's no question that over time, our Christmas observances have changed for almost everyone. Um, people's expectations have changed. People's needs have changed. People's um, uh, communities have changed. And as a consequence... I mean, when I was growing up, there was no live nativity, for example, at a church. Um, we stood up and wore angels' wings as kids and sang Christmas carols, and we were handed a bag of fruits and nuts when I was a little kid because we were in the country, and that's what we did. Yeah, we had, we had the, the children carried the day for Christmas. You know, whatever Christmas program you did, the children put on the pageant. And now you have increasingly elaborate, in fact, this church has a tradition with Bethlehem Walk. You know, that was extraordinarily sophisticated presentation year over year over year. So, so these things come and they go. Yeah, Roger? Well, one of the bigger uh, changes that's Sit on. over the years has been uh, where uh, when I was going to grade school, we had Christmas programs. Oh, yes. In, uh, the public schools, public schools, you have more and more Christmas programs through the public school. That's right. So, so these changes have taken place, and, and as they, as they uh, shift, they shift for different families. And um, as John mentioned, in some traditions, you know, you don't even start celebrating Christmas until Christmas. But you have 12 days through to the January the 5th. And then everything for many people goes down and you celebrate what's called Epiphany. Or in this time of year, Epiphany is a celebration celebrated by many, many Christian traditions that kind of kicks off with one or two uh, stories from the scriptures. Epiphany kicks off either with the story of the Magi coming to see Jesus, or it kicks off with John's baptism. In other words, Jesus going and being baptized by John. So who wants to take a stab at what, after the Christmas season, we've celebrated the birth of our Lord. So what is Epiphany about? What do you think that word's about? It's the story of the Magi and the story of Jesus' baptism. And those two stories indicate something very important that Christians for 1,800 years have celebrated. What do you think those two stories might indicate? So epiphany, go ahead. What's that? Yes, come on in. Certainly the life of Jesus. So epiphany is about, well, the word means manifestation in Greek. 
or it means appearance. The Orthodox use a slightly different word that's, that, that's easier to understand. And the, the word is theophany. It basically means God manifest, God appearing, God visible. Um, now, why does that work where the Magi are concerned? What's going on in the story of the Magi? They're following on a star. That's correct. And what does that star indicate? A king? Yep. And that the Magi, so, so it's supposed to be the king of the Jews, right? And we talked about this a little bit three weeks ago or two weeks ago. So the Magi are coming from where? Probably... Western Iran, Eastern uh, Babylonian territory, but most probably Zoroastrian figures. Uh, and they're coming to acknowledge this king, king of the Jews. Remember, who did they go to? They go to Herod. They just assume that, you know, let's go see Herod, right? Because he's the current king, so he must know who the next one's going to be. So you just go check. So they come traveling from afar because that's what we sing, right? They come from afar. <laughs> if you're in the South, that can be funny, from afar. <laughs> that's right. That's right. They come from afar. That's why the, they were probably wearing, you know, <laughs> the hat, fireman dance. Um, and they, they show up with King Herod, and they make inquiries about this king. <laughs> and Herod's like, oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. Um, I'll let you know when I find out. And, they, and they're like, please do, All right? Let's see, what is it, Matthew? I think it's Matthew chapter 2. Let me look. Hold on. <clears throat> oh, that magic. Let me read this just, just real quick, because it's fascinating. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, obviously, Herod's motives are not to uh, celebrate or worship this, uh, this king allegedly born as king of the Jews. But it goes on, it says, And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the people he's brought together to figure this out, they're like, well, he's got to be in Bethlehem somewhere, right? Because that's what the prophet said, that, 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 this, that this Messiah, if there is one that's been born. So Herod secretly called the Magi, and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. In other words, he's trying to figure out when was this child born. He wants to know, when did this thing take place under my nose that I know nothing about? And if it happened, it must have happened in Bethlehem, so say the scribes. And, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him... Report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Now, th this, is, this is really important because um, you have two movements here. On the one hand, you have those whose astrology 
in a place far, far away from Judea. Far, far away. We're talking about modern Iran, Persia. Have seen this star and it indicates something significant. Namely the birth of a new king. They come and they want to worship him. The king who's there alleges he wants to worship him. The king of Judea alleges he wants to worship him, but clearly that's not his motive. So when the Magi are celebrated in Epiphany among Christians, what might it be that we're celebrating if we make so much of the Magi. You know, we tend to just bang the Magi in with all the other Christmas stuff we celebrate, but historically, Christians have kind of separated the Magi out to celebrate this particular event on its own on January the 6th. What might that be about? What do you think? Somebody. Somebody. Take a shot at it. What do you think it's about? In all the Gospels, uh, the initial chapter, chapter are about Jesus. Jesus has actually shown up. But, uh, in this particular moment, you have the public reception. So you, you, you hear in Herod's um, unfavorable inquiry about this child. He invites the scribes to tell him, you know, the ones who are supposed to know, where is this king supposed to be born? And they tell him. And so now some momentum some public momentum has gathered around the arrival of this, of this Jesus, this child, with, a, with an expectation that this might be the Messiah. And as John suggests, for that expectation to be affirmed by Gentiles is, 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 the, is part of that epiphany part of that seeing, part of that recognition that, okay, the Jesus that the Messiah that we've all been waiting for may have just appeared or may now be manifest in our midst. How do you know that? Because even the Gentiles are coming to him. See, that, that's going to be a motif or a theme throughout the gospel that even the Gentiles come, and you see it over and over again. The Jews keep rejecting Jesus, but the Gentiles he encounters in the Gospels, they accept him. They receive him. And this is a theme that's experienced over and over and over again in the Gospels. And so an epiphany, an epiphany is a manifestation or a public awareness of that the Messiah is here. Yeah, Roger. Uh, one thing that was sort of surprising then was uh, when we think of Magi from the East, we think of them you know, the East. And quite often I associate Israel with Europe or European. Yeah. And it's pointed out in the debate with recently that Jesus was an Asian. Well, technically. That was Asian. Yeah. That was Asia. Technically, it's Asia. And it's Semitic. Um, and that entire region, uh, Persia, for many in the, that time, was some of the outer limits of, of uh, the empires that you would have any connection with. You know, the Persians would make their way, or had made their way already once, 
<laughs> and you know controlled that region, but then they, you know, they faltered under the Greeks, and then the Greeks controlled the region for most of the time, and then the Romans came and had it, and during Jesus' time, it was the Romans. Yeah, Ed? How does the uh, Magi know that it was the king of the Jews? You know, how, how, how did it come to them? Uh, I, I can only assume, because uh, I don't know, but uh, I can only assume that the both the star's location and timing was connected to the arrival of a king, and the story suggests that they followed the star, which led them to the, I mean, it looked like the star was over Judea. And they've made their way, because you can't go much further there, or you're in the ocean. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, if you're going that way, once you get to Judea, you're there. And so um, I think, I don't know that they started out knowing that, but it became apparent. But notice when they arrive, they're not sure where he is. And so they make inquiries. And Herod hears about it. And so he makes inquiries only to find out that it's Bethlehem. And, and so Bethlehem it is. And they go to check that out. So it goes on to say, and after hearing the king, they went their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Now. Are we talking about moving stars here? No. We're talking about stars that are shining, and they're moving, and of course, you know, it, they didn't do it that afternoon. It took a minute to get there, probably a day or two, um, depending on how, you know, aggressively they went after it. But it was, it was obvious that that's the direction they had to go in, because from where they were, that's where the star was. And so to describe the star directing them is not inaccurate. It's just not the way we describe it these days. Um, and so they found themselves going to Bethlehem. And, well, what does it say? And after coming into the house, well, when they saw the star, they rejoiced in it exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Now, there's also the element uh, coming from the east that their behavior suggests not only are they coming diplomatically, but they're actually... They're actually embracing the divinity of this child. It says they fell and worshipped him. Now, by divinity, do they mean what we mean necessarily? No. But, there was a, but there's a spiritual dimension to this coming king, and they knew that. And it would have been most appropriate. For example, you know... There were Caesars who considered themselves gods, and people worshipped them. Well, how did they worship this Jesus? Well, they brought gifts, they fell down before him, they acknowledged him uh, as uh, Messiah, and so it's a form of worship. Well, again, it's, we call it epiphany for that reason. They are behaving in a worshipful manner towards the one who is to be worshipped. And that, again, is suggestive of what Jesus' ministry and person will become. Name your Lord and Savior, or God. I mean, John, and I'm, we're talking about Matthew's gospel here. Now, in John, John lets you in on the secret straight away, right? Um, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace. That's John. But in Matthew, there's this kind of growing awareness. And the Gentiles are worshiping him. And that's suggestive of his being the king of the Jews, the, the, the Messiah waited for, and the one who is to be worshiped. That's a big deal. And 
Matthew gets that up and running very early on. So any questions about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I just have, well, I have an observation maybe. Please. It seems to me that wherever they came from, Persia, uh, Iraq, that area, they certainly would have been influenced perhaps by Jews that lived in those areas and known about the Messiah and what the Messiah meant. And therefore, they would have been more aware of the possibility of this being the Messiah in terms of what we think of as the Messiah being God and Jesus as opposed to just another king that that might involve worship. Right, and the way, I would, the way I would put that, I think, is that they, because these were theologically literate figures from Persia, there would have been an awareness, as you suggest, between literate theological persons of traditions from other places. And I don't know if they knew that when they started, but I think they figured it out as they were arriving that that's who this was, that that's who fit the bill given the location. So, yes, ma'am. I need some clarification. Sure. Well, <clears throat> and another thing, that star is big, and it was showing, shining for everybody. Right. Did people come from the water and from all the places to come in. Right. Um, <laughs> that's a tricky one. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Go ahead. If I can. Sure. They're astrologers. Yes. So they read the stars. They read yeah. the stars. It but their stars are spiritual beings. Yeah. And you get a bright one every now and then. A few thousand years, you get a big bright one. Probably dying. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it's hard to say. Part of it is an inference we draw from the fact that Herod goes back two years in order to set the limit on who is, which children are going to be destroyed. So some will assume that because of that, it, it was two years. It still appears to be that they're in Bethlehem. You know, it's still, it, but how long some would speculate, well, since he goes back two years, then, you know, he at least believes it's been two years. Yes? Well, it does say they did not come to the state. It says they come to, come to the house. So right. They were back in Nazareth in two years. Or they're, or they're in, or they're still in Bethlehem living with family. That's a possibility. Remember, that's where he's from. That's where Joseph's from. That's, his people are there. So they may or may not have been back in Nazareth. Because it, it doesn't say there. Yeah. For the wedding. And that could be nine months. I mean, it could be a long time. Yeah. 
Um, I think because they, they had, um, what would we call it today? They had diplomatic credentials. It was obvious who they were when they showed up. You know, their dress, they probably came with letters, you know, identifying themselves. But they came uh, in an official capacity. And John's right. Um, you know, we use the word astrology, and it sounds kind of, you know, kind of hokey. But they were, astrology was a serious, serious business. I mean, kings counted on these guys to tell them whether they were going to be successful in battle or not. These are the guys who would figure out the future for the king, and he would make decisions on the basis of their judgment. And how the stars lined up, in some cases, told you of all kinds of things. I mean, if you've ever had someone involved in astrology, like read, you know, your like cards, tarot cards and stuff like that, if you ever had anybody do that, it's astounding what they can come up with. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to give it, you know, modern legitimacy. What I'm saying is, is that it was an entire way of life that worked for them. And it wasn't astronomy, but it was astrology. And they read significance into their lives based on the moving movements of the stars. And when you had these anomalies, like an extremely bright star that's unusual, it had significance. And it put them on the move to go see what this was about. They may have been commissioned by their own king to go find out what was going on because it was in the East at a particular time in a particular way. But they, but they did. And so all of this is recorded for our benefit by Matthew. Remember, Matthew didn't record everything that happened, but he chose to record that. And Christians have seen it sufficiently significant to celebrate it every year for, you know, 1,800 years. Why? Because it's the first indication in the, uh, in the account that Matthew gives of a public acknowledgement of what God is up to in this Jesus. Why? Because it's drawing Gentiles. It's not just the inner spiritual hopes of the Jews this guy's got significance for people beyond the Jews. Well, that's quite a, quite a declaration that will play out all the way across. Good Lord, it's already 25 past. <laughs> that was quick. Um, other questions? So, yes, please. There you go. I've had an epiphany. And so right. when you celebrate epiphany, it's a revelation. And Christ was a revelation. And the wise man coming, in the simplest terms, was a revelation to a broader sense. That's putting it really simply. Sister, you have absolutely nailed it. Because, in fact, if I was going to title today's conversation, it would be Revelation. But we're not going to have time to go that far yet. We might start there next week because here we have here we have uh, the first event where you might say there's a kind of public revelation of who Jesus is and it happens again later in his ministry when he is baptized you know there's a voice there's a dove. There's the Holy Spirit's arrival in, that, in the image of the dove. And Christians have also seen that as a public moment where the significance of who Jesus really is is, um, is uh, revealed. Now, the, the last thing I want to point out is that Epiphany, though it's a day, January the 6th, every year for Western Christians, there's a season of Epiphany. So not only do you have Epiphany as a, as a day, 
But you celebrate, Christians historically have celebrated all the way up to Lent, um, these occasions in the gospel that are deemed to be moments where the divinity of Jesus or the person of Jesus, who he really is, is revealed. And it includes a lot of different things that happen in the life of Jesus' ministry that point directly to, is this God? Is this the Messiah? Things that might indicate that. So what, from your experience of reading the scriptures and so forth, what in the Gospels might indicate along the way from here on out that Jesus is who he says he is? First miracle, yep. What else? What, what kind of things happen in the ministry of Jesus? Checking the disciples and how willing they were to go with him. Right. I mean, just off the bat. What are some go other? Go yeah. What are some other events in his ministry that might cause you to go, uh, wow? Well, the choosing of the disciples. Okay. What are other ones? We had an early miracle at Cana. Water into wine. That's kind of how he closes the door on this thing. <laughs> In other words, you know, yeah, raising Lazarus from the dead is a big indicator. Um, in other words, there are multiple events that take place in the course of Jesus' ministry that reveal his divinity, uh, cause one to point and say, you know, he is someone unlike others and has a special role here. The fact that John says, you know, at his baptism, you know, it's not me, it's him. This is the guy. This is the one we've been waiting for. Um, that's got a lot to do with it. This is a public event. This is not some private spiritual thing that happens to Jesus. These things are happening to him in public in a big way. And so they're indicators. So the last thing I want to ask, and this is probably where we'll start next week, is you know, Christians have talked about... Um, manifestations of God, uh, epiphanies, revelations. Where do we get, where do we get our knowledge of God? I'm talking about it in our lives. Where do we get it? Where, 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 where would you say you've, how have you experienced or learned the most about God? From where? Okay, church, scripture, yeah. Were there other sources of knowing God? Uh, I guess the one in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Absolutely, that's it, Roger. Um, in fact, a long time ago, uh, Christians... Uh, certainly in the medieval period, like to divide knowing God into two big categories. There's God known through Scripture, the book of Scripture, and God known through the book of nature. Christians have always seen nature as a uh, way of understanding certain aspects of who God is. Um, and maybe we'll start there next week. We'll talk about how these manifestations work. And then we might mark some of them in Scripture where we see those in the ministry of Jesus, at least for a little while. Um, now, when Pastor Daniel gets back, we'll see what he wants to do. But at least for next week, we'll start there. How's that sound? All right? Any last questions before we conclude? Yeah. yeah we had a biologist in one of my previous churches and he made an interesting statement that uh, the Bible records at least 4,000 witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
So he says, compare that with evolution. How many witnesses do we have of evolution? <laughs> well, that if we get into those waters, it'll take us, uh, it'll take us six months. But uh, we will bring it up next week if that's all right. All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>